everybody. So as Nick said, my name is Yuna. It's pronounced like unicorn. Um, this is not the unicorn emoji, but there will be a unicorn emoji, so that's super exciting. I am a front-end developer at the Bluemix team at IBM. I started the SAS ADC meetup and ATX SAS meetup, and I'm also a member of the Open Design Foundation. But more importantly, I found this perfect tweet to describe what I do from Horse.js. And what I do is just breaking the web with CSS. And this talk is a perfect example of that, so if you're here to see some breaking the web, welcome, welcome. To get you in the mood, I have a video here. For a minute, I thought you was getting to be this a lady. Photoshop. It's going to be a and pleasure to Chrome. give you a lesson so in So I'm using Chrome in this presentation. You couldn't give me a lesson in long-distance spitting. Anything you can do, I can do better. I can do anything better than you. Oh, you can. Yes, I can. Oh, you can. Yes, I can. Oh, you can. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. All right, so now that you all feel me, now that we're all in the mood for this, let's get excited. So last week, I was in Bologna. That is a huge thing of tiramisu. It's, ri it's ridiculous how they feed you there. Like, it's insane. I didn't eat it alone, I promise. But anyway, um, while I was in Bologna, I wanted to do some traveling. So I go online, I go to the Train Italia website. I don't speak Italian, I'm so sorry. So I decided to translate the page from Italian to English. I translated the page, but I still see, oh god, I still see this. I could have blacked out. Um, so here I am wondering, what does this say? I thought I translated the page. Why is there a baby? I just want to buy a train pass to visit another city. I have no idea what it's saying. And I get really frustrated because this is an example of a designer just throwing it, like, a comp together in Photoshop and putting it online. Like, this isn't helping anybody. Here at CSS Comp, we have over 31 countries represented. That's amazing. Like, can we clap for the organizers really quick for that? So, like, this isn't going to help any of those people. It's fine. Let's talk about loading time. So the average loading time for Photoshop is 33 seconds. But my favorite part of this is not just do we have to wait and watch this load screen that we have nightmares of. They also want to highlight the names of the people responsible for this <laughs> while we wait. Cool, thank you. It's fine. Let's talk about responsive design in Photoshop. We're done talking about it. <laughs> you can download like a separate application. You could fake it, but you really can't do responsive design like you can do in the browser. And then the price. OK, that's a lot of money. It's $240 a year just for Photoshop alone. And Creative Cloud is $600 US dollars a year. It's quite a bit. But it's fine, because I can go to flamingtext.com and just make all of these logos. Look, I have like 20 logo options right now. I had to pay $0.00 for Google Chrome. And this is the worst part. So I remember trying to sign in to the browser, I'm to Photoshop, while I was on an airplane. I was trying to do some work. So it's like, sign in required. That's fine. I'm trying to sign up my ID. And then I get, please connect to the internet and retry. Um, I'm on an airplane. I don't have Wi-Fi. So what do I do? I hit cancel. Are you sure you want to quit? Yes, I want to quit. And then this is how I feel about Photoshop from now on. Oh, God. So this talk is going to focus on filters and blend modes specifically, and we're also going to talk about gradients a little bit, but there is a vast variety of things that you can do in the browser instead of opening Photoshop to do them, cutting images out. There's so much. So I'm just going to be focusing on these few topics. And before I move on, just a note. Normally, I would be using something like PostCSS and Auto Prefixer to take care of my vendor prefixing, but um, I'm using just a style block with content editable and this demo and just vanilla CSS. So um, I'm going to have to do some WebKit filter prefixing. Um, so just keep that in mind. You won't actually have to do that in real life. So starting with CSS filters. The, um, Compatibility for CSS filters is pretty good. The only browser that's really not doing it yet is Edge, but um, hopefully that will change. So here, yeah, I can zoom out a little bit. There we go. So the options that we have for CSS filters are blur, brightness, contrast, drop shadow, grayscale, hue, rotate, invert, opacity, sepia, and saturate. So we have a few different options here. And just to show an example here, um, some of the more interesting ones I find are like drop shadow because it takes this. Um, shape of that image. So here we have a PNG, and if I move this out a little bit, you can really see that this drop shadow is taking the shape of that image. So instead of a box shadow that just takes um, the size of the box or it takes the border size, it will just take the size of that image itself. So that's pretty cool. 
Blur does what you would think it does. It works with any really unit value here. So we could do like 0.2 m's if we want, um, any, any unit value here. So brightness, obviously, anything that is greater than 1 for brightness will increase the brightness. Anything less will decrease it. So a brightness of 0 just makes it black. Another interesting one that I will talk about and highlight here is invert. So invert also takes no parameters. So if you have no parameters in there, it takes it as value of 1, completely inverts your image here. If it's an invert value of 0.5, it's completely grayscaled. Because the way that you invert pixels is you take the luminance value and you subtract it from 1. So right here, when you do invert 0.5, you're taking all the luminance values and setting them closest to that 50% gray. So um, the rest are kind of self-explanatory grayscale. Hue rotate is another fun one that I can highlight. So this you can play with. So here's like 0 degrees, and then I could do like 180 degrees. It rotates the hue of that color just on a circular plane by the degree that you um, basically set it to here. So you can solve a lot of really small problems by using filters very briefly. This is a blog post that I wrote. And I use the paper app. Um, so I use the paper app, and what happens when you use the paper app is you get this gray background. But I wanted to flow into this white background a little bit on my page. So I just set this WebKit filter, and as you can see, all the images here do have that gray. But instead of opening all these images in Photoshop, editing them all individually, I just had to add a WebKit filter, or just a regular filter of brightness 1.1. I could have used um, a contrast filter, and it just makes it flow a lot better into this document. One line of code, beautiful. Thank you, CSS filters. And you can also have some fun with it. Because it is CSS, you can do fun things like animate. This is literally five lines of code. I'm using a hue rotate animation, and it's creating this visualization, just super quick, super easy, um, and something that's inherent to us. So blend modes, this is where things start to get really interesting. Um, so there are two types, background blend mode and mixed blend mode. And background blend mode works on the background items within an element. So if an element has multiple backgrounds, you can use this to kind of channel how those different backgrounds interact with each other. So the support on this is a little worse than filters. Um, Edge, again, doesn't really have much, but it's getting there. So um, mixed blend mode is very similar with the supports. And this takes that element itself and talks about how it's going to blend in with the other elements on the page behind it. So all of the blend mode options that we have in Photoshop are listed here. And CSS has a majority of these. So I'm going to kind of walk through how those work a little bit. So um, the blend mode types, there are five different types. There is the darken modes group. There are lighten modes, um, contrast modes, comparative modes, and composite modes. So I'm going to use my balloon friend here to help me explain this Munsell color system with web color names here. So as you can see, there is a rainbow projected on this balloon. And if you look at these lights from the top of the stage, it's the lightness value. That's the luminosity. So it's shining down the light, and it kind of becomes a cone of darkness at the bottom. Now, you can see the whole range of colors surrounding the balloon. And the very inside of the balloon, that center point, is a 50% gray. So no matter what, the light can't shine in all the way. It becomes 50% gray. You still have light from the top coming down. So the most saturated value is what this balloon gets from that light projecting immediately. Thank you to the awesome light team here. I also want to give them a round of applause. Let's keep that up there, because it'll help explain the blend modes when I keep going. Um, but I figured I might as well take a balloon off the wall and use it while I have the opportunity. Um, so to explain dark and blend modes, I'm going to use the help of vanilla ice and vanilla ice cream. So let's start with multiply. OK, we're multiplying them. We're going to overlap our images. So the way that multiply works is it uses the luminance level, so that light level of the pixels in each space of these two images. And it just multiplies the pixels. Um, math terms, it just does A times B. And this is a lot like transparencies. So if you take two different transparencies and overlay them and then shine a light through, that's what the multiply blend mode does. So if your pixel value is 1, if luminosity is 1, it shines all the way through. But the more you layer, the darker it gets. So darken works in a similar way, except it uses the RGB values. So it's not as dark, because it's using the color range on a per, color, a per channel basis to sort of detect which color should remain and which, which leave. So if the active layer pixels, the active layer is the ice cream here. I'm only applying the blend mode to that active layer. If those pixels are darker, then they stay. But if they're lighter than the tones of the pixels behind them, they're replaced by those tones. The last one is color burn 
which is the most saturated of all of these. Um, and it also uses the luminance values, but it uses an inversion um, algorithm to sort of have that more saturated look. So for light and blend modes, we're going to have a dog surfing and a dog skateboarding. Who's the winner here? So screen blend mode is the opposite of the multiply blend mode. It is inverting the pixels, so how, like I mentioned earlier, it's doing one minus that luminosity value, and then it's multiplying that for both the active and background layer, and then it's inverting the product of that. So it's inverting it again. And this basically means that we're um, multiplying the light pixels. Um, so then lighten is using those RGB values. It's not as bright as screen. And color dodge is the brightest, so it blows things out the quickest of all of these light and blend modes. Next, we have the contrast group. So here we're going to do oatmeal and a comic from the oatmeal. I really worked hard on these puns, y'all. All right, so we're going to do overlay. So one thing that the contrast group is, it uses a combination of light and darken modes in different ways. Um, so for overlay, for example, specifically, it uses both the screen and the multiply blend mode, both in half strength. And it takes those mid-tones 50% gray and just drops them. So that's how that works. Um, soft light is a little bit more organic. It keeps those 50% mid-tones. And then hard light is the most dramatic. Um, so they all sort of work in similar ways with the contrast group. Comparative blend modes are next. And so we have an Oreo rainbow. This is my favorite group. And then Tim Tams for all the Australians here. It's a Tim Tam bridge. I wanted to bridge the gap because I want Tim Tams in America. Anyway, let's make that happen with difference. Oh my gosh, so this group um, does something pretty fun. So it basically takes pixels that are on the same space of the two values, and it um, inverts the pixels based on the luminance channels on a channel-by-channel -channel basis. So you take the active layer pixel and you subtract it um, from the same layer on the background pixel. And for difference, it uses selective inversion, where similar colors will turn black. Um, they'll cancel each other out and turn black, but it inverts it. So the original point and use case of difference was lining up transparencies. When you had the perfect black on black, that's how you knew that things were perfectly aligned. Um, exclusion is pretty similar to difference, but it has those 50% gray midtones. So it's a little bit lighter than the um, difference blend mode. And then we have one last group, and that's the composite blend mode. That's why I'm glad that my friend Klaus here is helping. So we've got the, the Wi-Fi password, pretty much. So we got cat pictures, as promised, and pew pew lasers. Um, so this is kind of interesting. What happens here is with the active layer, so the lasers, it only takes the hue. It keeps that hue color, but it's mixing it with both the luminosity and the saturation of the background layer. So since the cats are so bright, it keeps that bright white. It's only taking the hue, and since they're not very saturated, that hue shade is going to become lighter um, over top of the cats in this demo example. So saturation only takes the saturation of the lasers. So it takes the colors of the cats, so their eyes become very bright blue, their fur becomes very, very saturated, but the value, the color value remains, and so does the luminosity. So luminosity is going to look a little different than all of these. This one is taking just the luminosity, so the basically the blacks and whites of the laser image and imposing the cat's coloring on top of that, the hue. And then my favorite of all these is the color blend mode. So this one's really cool because it uses both the hue and saturation of the active layer, so of those lasers, and it's layering it on top of just the luminosity of the cats. So in essence, it's like taking a black and white photograph and overlaying that with a color image. But the best part is the photograph doesn't have to be black and white because the browser is doing that for us. It's making it happen. So anything you can just use to color on top of an image with the mixed blend mode of color. So you can do a lot of really fun techniques. If we look at that example again of the header that I made for that blog post, um, something that we can do is add like a mixed blend mode of multiply. And it starts to really blend into that background. And this could be any color. Um, this could be like a, that's a blue color. OK, that's cool. We'll keep it as a, a purple. Um, so we can make it multiply. But remember how it wasn't exactly white? We still had to do a WebKit filter to increase the brightness or the contrast. Let's do the contrast, like 1.1. And there it's flowing perfectly in with the background. We could do a hue rotate. Some of those um, shapes might start to change color. We can really start to dynamically play around with this 
just like in the browser, it's probably more like 130 degrees, like that changes. Another option is we can do um, a screen blend mode, which is the opposite of multiply, like we went over, and then we would just have to go in and invert that. So you can really start to play around with things just dynamically in your browser, and you can be super lazy about it. In fact, I call this the lazy designer method. <laughs> so there are two parts to this. The first one is you use the blend mode of multiply or screen, and then you isolate the graphic with contrast filters and possibly the physical shape of it. So um, as an example, here's a picture I took in Bologna from the rooftop of the hotel last week. Super cool. And I just have a little hello waving back and forth. But if we really dissect this, you'll see what's going on in the background. So let's make it a little bit bigger, because um, I cut down the size. 500 is too big. So 300 by maybe the height of 400. And then you start to think, like, what is that? It's not the fun little hello that I thought it was. Let's get rid of that multiply blend mode. OK. Let's get rid of the WebKit filter. Um, we can get rid of the positioning. So if you take a look, it's me holding up a random coaster at a bar that I took a picture of and I overlaid it on top of a graphic. And you can't tell at all with that lazy designer method because I'm using blend modes and filters. It's pretty cool. Another example of this, um, thank you. <laughs> Being lazy. Here's another example of this, but I used the screen blend mode. So I took this random little sketch. I could just reload because it's a browser thing. Ooh. Um, and here's me undoing that. It's just a sketch from my sketchbook. I am using these same technique, but with screen. And it just becomes an element in the page and allows for a really nice flow. Awesome um, websites that use blend modes, for instance, Front End London, they have this really nice gradient of hot pink to red on this page. And you can even use it for um, performance optimization, because you can use just a grayscale image in that background for the JPEG, decrease the color size, decrease the image size, and use blend modes to ma like make this dynamic and um, really interesting composition, regardless of the images that you have in there. Another example is Polygon. They have a really unique look on their home page for this news story. It's not something that you see often these days, but it's a really nice aesthetic to see. And then the XOXO conference uses blend modes. And my favorite part of blend modes is you can scroll around. You can animate them. You can really make this dynamic and exciting for your user. It's just such a little thing that allows for a much more unique aesthetic. So let's go back in time for a little bit. Back to the days of DeviantArt. Does anyone here do DeviantArt? Yeah. Awesome. So back in the day, I remember I would go on and I would look for Photoshop actions. And here was like this description. I don't, don't read that. It's way too much text. Please don't read it. So anyway, I wanted to start recreating these Photoshop actions. So um, I found one that sounded interesting. Raging Mist offers the most faded out look of all of these. It fades out images with purple hues and warmer tones to create a sultry vintage effect. Sounds sultry. Let's do it. All right, so let's recreate Raging Mist filter. That's the Raging Mist filter, and that's our original image. So let's start. Um, the first thing that we can do is use some filters. So WebKit filter, like I'm using a sepia because I see some more warm tones. I'm going to do a hue rotate to start getting it there. Maybe increase the saturation. OK, so that's great. That's on the image itself. That's step one. Step two is adding a layer on top. So I'm going to show you that I have a layer on top of here with a background color. I'll start with red so you could see it. OK, so I didn't lie. There's something up there. Um, so now I want to do a mix blend mode of um, maybe like multiply. So it's laying on top of that image. Um, but that's not exactly the color that we want, is it? No. So what you can do is open your dev tools and use it like a browser, pretty much like Photoshop. You can use a really nice color selector here. You can change the, um, the alpha channel. And you can even select from the page to start getting that aesthetic that we want. Like I could just keep clicking around. Maybe if I don't like that color, I could edit it a little bit. But it's starting to really look like the image that we want to get for the final. So that's good. And there's only one step left. If we really look at this Raging Mist example here, uh, I have to move it more. You'll notice that in the darkest parts, we're losing some detail in the shadow. There's sort of this wash over it. It's like a washout effect. It's like this vintage, it's a little bit purpley, gray effect there. So let's make that happen. This is what I like to call the washout effect method. Got some nice methods for you. So the first step is to use the blend mode of lighten. And after we've done that, we want to use the background color of the shadow color, so the darkest color that we want to appear on our image. So here's an example of doing that. Um, so I set the background mode to lighten. And then I am choosing this secondary background. 
Um, so those are just two backgrounds, comma-separated values. And as I go lighter, the background becomes lighter. And then I can choose that darkest color that I want to appear on the page. Every other color will get washed out. So let's do that. Um, so, all right, I have my first background here. Let's make another background of red, for instance. And like I said, we're going to do a background blend mode of lighten. OK, so that's not exactly the shade that we want. It's washing out a little too much. So again, I'm going to inspect element. I'm going to find this image, find that red, and sort of just set it to like a deeper hue, maybe like a purpley washout tone. I think that looks pretty close, so I'm going to keep that. I have this value here. And um, yeah, that looks pretty good for the Raging Mist filter. <laughs> Not bad. It could be worse. But it could be better. So let's kick it up a notch to see us as gradients. OK, so I'm going to just go through this really quickly. Basic gradients, you just can do a linear gradient. Um, set two colors. It starts at the 50% mark. So I'm using this pink color, C69, which is the SAS color. Um, so I like to use that for everything. And then <laughs> the second color is like this blue shade. So it's basic gradient. You can change the directions. So I could do two right. I could do like two left, two top, two bottom, whatever. I can change those directions. I can do degrees. So here I have negative 20 degrees. I could do like 120 degrees. It changes. Um, the direction of that gradient. You can also open the dev tools here and watch it spin, which is really fun, because you could just like hit shift and arrow key, and it'll like spin for you. Um, so that's something I, I have no life. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so the next thing that I want to talk about is the gradient stops. Um, these are fun. A cool thing is like the further you go towards these stops, um, you can actually make like stripes. So if I keep going and I set these both to 30, like that makes a solid line because it's fewer and fewer pixels for a gradient to occur on. And then what you can do is you can make like repeating gradients. So you could make stripes across your page. These are really fun for backgrounds and other such things. Um, we have the radial gradients. So this takes the shape of the element that it's contained within. But you can also set the shape of that um, radial. So I can make it a circle. I can say, like, I want it to be like a 200 by 30 pixel weird shape. Um, and you have a lot of control with this as well. And there's also stripes that you can do. So I could do a repeating radial gradient. Um, so if I wanted those solid stripes, what I could do is set like the start color. So start C69. I'm going to end. Let's make this pixel so it's easier to see. 10 pixels. I have next color starting at 10 pixels. And then I'm going to have it ending at that same color. Um, maybe I want this 30 pixels wide. So now I have this crazy gradient. Let's do a circle so it's not so crazy. Um, but yeah, you could just do radial stripes and play around. CSS is so much fun. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. So conic gradients are really cool. I think Leah's going to be talking about them later. Go check that out or just stay in this room and listen to her talk. I cannot wait to watch this. So um, that's something to look forward to later. All right, so this is an example of just using those blend modes with the gradient. So here's just a basic image. Here is the, just the gradient that I'm applying to it, and it creates all of these image variations. Um, there's so many different aesthetics by playing around, and they all look pretty good. I could have probably chosen any of these. Um, but wait, there's more. <laughs> Double bam. All right, I'm going to take you back in the day again to the days of these um, free blurry backgrounds. So blurry backgrounds are really cool, right? Um, we all kind of use them. We can break that down and make them ourselves. You know, why open Photoshop and make one when we can make these with gradients? So you can break it down and look at that one. Um, it has this magenta to royal blue color. There's like this purple spot at the bottom. There's this wheat spot at the top. Maybe some um, angled gradients of this like tomato and light blue color. This is why I'm really good at named CSS colors. I don't know. It's not a good thing. It's fine. OK, so let's zoom in and make this thing happen. All right, so there's the final product that we're going for. Um, here's our background that's going to happen. I think a good place to start is with this linear gradient that goes from like hot pink to blue. OK, so there's that. But we don't want it to go from top to bottom. We want it to go to right. So let's make it go to right. Um, maybe this is more like a deep pink. I don't, I, like I said, I don't know why I know all these color names. It's fine. OK, so that's a good place to start. I think the next best thing is to make that light spot at the top. So it's like this creamy color. So we'll do a radial gradient. 
at the top, um, and it'll be from like wheat to transparent. Uh, we want a comma. Okay, so that's, that's cool, and we want it to be at top, so I can say where I want to be positioned at. And maybe I want this to be a circle at the top, or maybe I want to specify the shape of it, but I think the circle is okay for now. Um, and I want it to be a little bit offset from the page, so I could do like negative 10% is the start of that, and I want it to end at like 80%. Okay, so we're starting to sort of get there. Okay, so next, maybe beneath that, we have this, um, this tomato color, so we have a linear gradient. And I know that it's going to be at a degree, so maybe like 160 degrees, and it's going to be tomato, it's going to be transparent. I'm going to add a comma. All right, so that's starting to look more like what we have. But to save you all this pressure of watching me go through all of it, I've already done it. <laughs> look at that. <laughs> so what's really exciting about this is it's super powerful for creating your own customized filters. You can create anything when you use this technique. And I use it on this site. Um, I used a very similar one to the one I just showed you, and it adds this really unified aesthetic to this page. So without them, these images are kind of boring, and they blend to the background. It doesn't look that good. But if I add a custom filter that I make out of these gradients, it really brings them together and unifies them on the page. So you can make Instagram filters very, very quickly and easily. Pretty, pretty easily. Um, so here's a picture of the office area of my apartment. And I use it as an example. So like Ray's, um, Aiden, I just did these for fun. Um, Inkwell, the cool thing about that is I don't even have to use another after element to add some kind of blend mode. I just used WebKit filters for that one. Um, and then for Perpetua, I didn't use any WebKit filters. I just used um, a blend mode afterwards. It's like this blue to gray, um, blue to green sort of fake. So let's review, because we're at the end here. CSS filters plus CSS blend modes plus CSS gradients equal awesome. And in conclusion, CSS is awesome. Like, you can't do this in Photoshop. You can't have this hue rotate animation in a presentation in Photoshop very easily. I, I don't think. Don't tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> but this is just the beginning. Like, this is really exciting. Like, this is where we are right now. We're at this very basic Mario game. But soon we're going to be at, like, Super Mario 3D World. You know? When browsers start to really implement these and make them work really well with our um, GPUs, it's really good to just start playing around now. So I say art the web. If you make something cool, if this talk inspired you, use the hashtag art the web. Start to use these things in, in um, your own personal projects or in production. I sort of played around with it on the site that I made. Um, I do a little bit of traveling, and I write about it sometimes. I call it bad poetry of good memories. Um, and if you want to go to it, it sort of was like a tester for some of the concepts that I talked about in this talk. So I'm using some different things like um, CSS shapes, and I'm using some of the filters and blend modes. Looks way better on your browser in Chrome 44. I know, I don't care, it's fine. Um, just a tester, so don't be like, I can't see this in IE. I know you can't see it in IE, I know. So thank you so much for having me, and thank you to the Light Crew.